Uh, welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison. I'm Senior Vice President here and Director of the Global Health Policy Center. And welcome to CSIS. Um, we have a great program um, this afternoon. Um, I'll introduce our, our keynote speaker and, and, our, and, our, and our keynote discussant momentarily. I just want to offer some thanks to people who put in an enormous amount of effort to pull this together. And I also welcome those who are with us online. Um, there's over 100 people online here um, today as we gather to, to hear about the Financing Global Health 2013 report. Uh, Lindsay Hammergren, Catherine Streifel uh, were particularly uh, integral to pulling this together. Thank you so much. Alicia Kramer, Brianna Bacchus, Chris Mallard, Travis Hopkins, Annie Anderson, Joe Jordan, Carolyn Schroet, Jesse Swanson. Thank you all. From the um, uh, <clears throat> Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the University of Washington. Uh, we were uh, very happy to work with Catherine Leach Kimon uh, throughout the organization, and thank you very much, Catherine, for all of your help. And there's a number of other uh, staff from IHME here today, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we were very honored to be able to uh, to uh, have Chris come here today to um, uh, talk about this new very important piece of work, and as we'll hear, it's an optimistic argument. It's, an, it's a case of resilience in the face of austerity. It's trying to unpack what that means and, and describe what it all is about, and we're here today really to talk about, to hear that presentation and have a conversation around what the policy implications are, particularly in this environment here in Washington, D.C., where budgetary issues remain a very serious matter of concern, and this is about money. And when I told Chris that, you know, the overwhelming response, over 300 RSVPs and 150 online, and that he must be approaching rock star status to be coming that, he said, well, maybe, but it may be that the re fact of the report is about money, and people come when we're talking about money. Uh, but it's a very important piece of work, and it blends together the kind of innovation and analyses that IHME has, has become known for and famous for under Chris's leadership, and that is <coughs> trying to blend together uh, ever better metrics around, uh, around financing, and in this case, match it up against the data from the global burden of disease, and to ask a bunch of hard questions around uh, where are the trend lines uh, in, in the financing, and how do those match up against what we think of as the as the requirements and the demands that the that the that the actual burdens of disease present. Um, Chris Murray is the professor of global health at the University of Washington. He's the institute director and founder of the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluations, um, a uh, 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 an institution that before uh, it it was founded, we were really <coughs> left with far fewer options in this kind of in this kind of analytic. Um, uh, data and so he has driven forward uh, uh, both the bur global burden of disease approach, but also the approach around DALIs, uh, and um, really uh, had uh, landmark impacts um, in these in these areas. And we're very pleased to have him here today. He has you have his biography here. Uh, he has a very distinguished history of working at WHO and working at Harvard, and um, uh, and now out in Seattle. Um, he's both a physician and a, um, a public health expert. Um, as, a, as the lead-off discussant for this session, Chris is going to come up, do the presentation for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to sit and have a conversation. And we'll turn to Ariel Pablos Mendez uh, to kick that off. And Ariel is familiar to, to many, if not all of you here. He's the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID. He's been there for two and a half years. We're very fortunate that the Obama administration was successful at recruiting him into that position. He uh, came to us and from a, a very distinguished set of accomplishments, pioneering work at the Rockefeller Foundation, particularly around the transformation of health systems, uh, an area that requires that sort of energy and creativity and intellectual dynamism that Ariel has brought to the task here and, and infused AID with that. He's a board-certified internist and until recently was a practicing physician at Columbia 
and uh, as a graduate of the University of Guadalajara School of Medicine and an MPH from Columbia University. So uh, please join me in welcoming Chris Murray for the opening part of this. We'll cut to the audience fairly rapidly uh, after we've had an initial round. And please jump forward and offer your comments and questions. So thank you. Chris, <clears throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Steve, for those uh, overly generous uh, introductory remarks, not for Ariel, but for me. And uh, it's my pleasure to speak about our work at IHME on finance and global health. You all have the report. Uh, it should be clear right up front that my role here is a sort of talking puppet. The real work was done by uh, Joe Dealman, our faculty lead on health financing, and the team that works with them. And uh, we heard also already about Katie leach keeman who's played a key role. So two slides on definition, and then I'm going to switch over to what I think of as uh, a more modern way to present, which is with one of our live tools online, which you can all access on your uh, smartphones uh, and when you go back home. So we use some terminology that we should all be clear about because it'll, always, it'll come up in Q&A. Uh, we are trying to track money flowing essentially from north to south uh, that's for health. Our definition is different than overseas development assistance because we also look at private flows, about NGOs, foundations, private contributions. Uh, we also try to avoid double counting, which is what makes this task rather time consuming and not hugely fun to do because we need to go through the financial statements of all sorts of organizations to trace flows, because we're all familiar with money going from uh, USAID to Gavi to back to UNICEF and back over to somewhere else. And so we have this huge set of cross flows that we try to disentangle. Uh, we use terminology around source and channel, which I'll speak about uh, in a moment, uh, that will also, well, it's here on this slide, which is to help us with the double counting and help people think through USA, US government role as a direct bilateral donor versus its funding that goes through the global fund, as an example. We talk about the channel of assistance, which is the last or the penultimate holder of the dollar before it goes to a activity uh, dedicated to uh, health in the developing world. And then the underlying source. So we'll show you both types of uh, information. And that's an important uh, thing to understand. We also uh, are looking at the recipients, which are the implementing institutions. And sometimes they, the same institution will show up in these different bundles, because somebody may be a source, a channel, and an implementer. And that also complicates some of the analysis. This is our uh, fifth of these reports. And I think with each cycle, the uh, methods get better. The data has gotten richer. Uh, we've been able to add much more detail about the analysis of NGOs this time around. And so I think uh, the, the value of this has grown. But it also means that we go back each time and recompute the time series. We also update into real dollars uh, that are current. So that's why each report is, uh, stands on, on its own and provides a coherent time series. OK, so let's see if this is going to work. We're going to go to our browser. Uh, this is live, so available for all of you to use. And I'm going to walk through uh, the main results using our new Financing Global Health online visualization. So I'm going to start with channel. And the thing to, to be aware of is that when we look at channel, uh, the data goes right through 2013. We make, uh, using budgets and historical budget execution data, we make estimates right through 2013. When I'm going to show you source, it's only through 2011, because we need to have the fully audited financial statements published before we can do that sort of analysis. Bottom line story is that uh, assistance for uh, development assistance for health has gone up from around $6 billion in real dollars in 1990, went through a slow period of growth to around about 2001, the decade of rapid expansion all the way up to 2010. 
And then we've had this period of sort of bouncing around and slow uh, growth back in the 1990s rate of growth since 2010. So the global financial crisis, where I think some people expected this curve to sort of drop off a cliff, didn't occur. And we've actually seen the resources continue to grow. Uh, now, here's the allocation. Remember, this is by channel. This is US bilateral, huge big role. And I think you can see the shift in the composition of funding, if our tool will work. There we go. I'm shifting to a percentage view, just to make some points on the change in the makeup of funders. So the bank and the regional banks, both IDA and IBRD windows, are in the gray colors. And the bank as a percentage was much more important in the 90s and early 2000s. And although they've grown in absolute terms, they're a much smaller player in this bigger 30 plus billion world that we live in. The expansion of the Global Fund and Gavi is very clear as a new channel. Uh, the decreased importance is a fraction of resources from the early 90s of the UN system. Uh, increased growth in absolute terms, but dramatically smaller share of total resources. And then the expanded role, particularly in the last 10 years, of US bilateral sources. Uh, clear in there. Now, I think there's a lot of interest in recent trends since the crisis, and that's on the right-hand panel. And with this slider here, we can uh, actually move first back to the whole 23-year uh, time series. And you can see where the absolute expansion in different funders has been. Notice that France in the 23 years is actually down. Uh, and all the other funders are up over that time period. And if we then focus in uh, on the, the most recent time period, you can see that we're get, by channel, Global funding has maintained its volume and gone up slightly because of big increases in flows through Gavi and Global Fund, decreases through the US bilateral window, and increases through UK bilateral, and then also the capacity of NGOs, uh, which is both US government money, but money they've raised themselves. Now, you can see that distinction if we go to source. Let's go back to the uh, seeing the numbers. Sorry, I'm not sure why this is, there we go. So again, only through 2011 where we can break this down. Here you can see the full US contribution, 11 billion in 2011, as opposed to the 8 billion in 2011 that was through the bilateral channel. Uh, you can also see the uh, evolution of both US expansion, and if I shift the ranges here on this diagram so we can see the percentages over the time period, you can see, counting all flows, the expansion of uh, global health, very strongly linked to the expansion of the US in absolute terms, but also important contributions from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation over that period, from Canada, from Germany, and of course the UK. When you see this in percentage terms, I think probably no surprises. Not sure why my... Uh, but there's one thing that you would miss in the absolute numbers that I think is worth drawing attention to, and that is the shifting role of some of the bilaterals. So here, as source goes, if you look uh, on the role of Japan, 3% now, and back in the 90s, it was a much bigger player. It was actually as much as 8 or 9% of the total role. So Japan's role <laughs> in bilateral funding for global health has also been shifting over time in percentage terms. OK, going to the regional view on this tool, we can also look at the patterns that we see. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the internet. There we go. Uh, so here we break down where we can the allocation of funds by region. So here's uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, <laughs> East Asia and the Pacific, and then you can see Europe, Central America, et cetera, and you can see the big expansion of funding into Sub-Saharan Africa over the longer period. And if we focus in on the more recent time period, post, uh, in the last three years, for example, you can see big expansions in Sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa have continued. Now, I think probably some of the more interesting findings from our point of view is when we look at the health focus area. And so a few caveats on the health focus area. When we look at health focus area, we're using searches of project descriptions. 
uh, to try to identify what the funds are going for. So it's an imperfect science, uh, although it's pretty details in orientation. And <clears throat> what you can see here is the expansion of HIV and pretty leveling off of growth around about 2011. We don't have the 12, 13 figures because we need the fully audited books to be able to get this right. <coughs> the big expansion that's occurring is maternal and newborn child health over this time period. So if I focus in on the 2006 to 2011 range, you can see that there's been greater growth in funding for maternal, uh, newborn, and child health than there has been for HIV AIDS. So the period from 2010 to 2 to 10, which was really driven by HIV expansion, has now been replaced more recently by continued expansion around maternal and child health, uh, smaller expansion around HIV AIDS, and you can see these comparatively different figures for TB and malaria. Now, we can also in this tool do some comparisons that are in the report. And I'm going to explore uh, the relationship here between development assistance and disability adjusted life years from the Global Burden of Disease 2010 study, uh, which gives us a time trend of burden from 1990 to 2010. Uh, just a little advertising, the GBD 2013 will be coming out beginning next month and rolling through June and July. And, and so there'll be a new update uh, right through to 2013 uh, soon. But this is based on our analysis published uh, a year and a half ago of the GBD 2010. And one way to look at this is to look at development assistance for health compared to DALIs. And we're looking in 2011. And I'm going to use this slider on this map to start and focus in on those countries that get the most development assistance for health per DALI, which we think is probably the easiest or the most appropriate thing for thinking about DAH and, and need. And as we move down the slider here, you start to see the countries that have uh, more and more of uh, the funding, and they're on the scatter plot, which is DALIs versus money, they're on the top part of the curve. They're on the upper part. In other words, getting more money per DALI than countries that are down here. And you know, around about this threshold, you can see the PEPFAR corridor, where money related to HIV. You can see per DALI that bank loans from the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank largely, and a little bit of bilateral aid in Latin America and the Caribbean is actually large per unit of need. And you can see a patchwork of other countries, such as Laos, Cambodia, Afghanistan, uh, that show up as having substantial development assistance per DALI. Whereas West Africa and Central Africa, historically Francophone Africa, getting much, much less per uh, unit of need. And you have to go f quite far down that scale to see where it's going. Now, another aspect of our study is tracking government health expenditure. And there's been quite a steady growth of government health expenditure, even post-crisis. One way to look at development assistance in the light of government health expenditure of their own resources, so this is what we call government health expenditure as source, that's from their own tax revenue, is to compare DAH to government health expenditure. And we can go up to the places where they're equal or above. So for every dollar of government health expenditure from their own revenue sources, these countries shown in red get one or more dollars from development assistance. So greater than 50% uh, coming, or greater than that one-to-one -one ratio coming from development assistance. Uh, you can see countries in East Africa, but also DRC. Uh, you can see Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea-Bissau, Afghanistan, and Cambodia in that category. If we lower it down to the one to three ratio, you get that pattern. So there's a few other countries where development assistance is really quite an important component vis-a-vis -vis what the government's able to spend of their own resources. Come down to the ratio of 15 cents to every government dollar, and you throw in a few more countries. Some of them, uh, you know, the, you can look at the map and make sense of why, either geopolitically or need-wise, uh, they're major recipients of development assistance. 
So those are some of the key findings that you can explore. We can also do this type of analysis, for example, for maternal and newborn child health, and we can see where that, relative to government spending, uh, is actually very prominent. And perhaps even on the disease-specific basis, more relevant is to go to the disability-adjusted life year comparison to see where relative to need, where are the countries on the MNCH front that are getting the most dollars uh, compared to need. Remembering we include in our definition of development assistance for health the transfers through the regional banks, IDA and IBRD. And that explains what we're seeing over here in Latin America. So the pattern here for MNCH is really quite different than the pattern that we see where resources go vis-a-vis -vis need compared to HIV AIDS. <coughs> or again, just to zoom in on where the contributions are the greatest, uh, per unit need, you get some unusual recipients uh, on the HIV front. And I think there's other ways that I'm sure you've seen that try to quantify that. Uh, that yes, the volume of money, as we saw earlier, per DALI is going in the PEPFAR corridor, but if you think of DALIs per HIV, I mean, dollars per HIV DALI, there's some <coughs> places that get quite a lot compared to need. So let me uh, actually end there on this uh, presentation. I think what we hope is that this tool is both, I'll be mean, giving you enough information to get Ariel going with some uh, comments, and also that this tool's online now, and hopefully a resource for everybody to use, uh, hopefully nice. as engaging as the well-written report, but uh, maybe more fun to play with than uh, flipping through the report. So thank you very much. Go ahead. We're going to move this. Yep. <clears throat> you want some help? Right in the middle. <clears throat> Go, ahead. Sure. Go ahead. You can sit back there. Yeah. Maybe you should go in the middle. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um, a very intriguing tool. Um, in the report, you know, you, your, your main proposition <coughs> is that uh, we've seen a surprising resilience. We've seen almost 4% growth last year, at bringing things over 31 billion. You try to identify in multiple transitions that sort of drive this process forward. Donor resolve, the force of MDGs. You, I, you track pretty well that there's a stalwart core of donors that are, that are there, right? The USG, uh, UK, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that sort of offset the weakening of others. You bring forward that the Global Fund and Gavi Alliance are showing surprising strength and ever greater strength with the support of their major funders so that in this sort of decade after the decade of explosive growth, the multilateral instruments, these instruments are sort of hitting their stride. And even after having some serious bumps and becoming, it's becoming a more multilateral world as part of this. And you make some surprising points about the NGO contributions that, okay, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's at 2.2 billion, but that the in the rear of your report, you enumerate a, the big muscular American and non-American NGOs are bringing in non-official dollars that total 1.7 billion, and then you add in another half a billion of corporate contributions. Uh, very interesting. And then perhaps most important, that the surge of, of, of funding into the maternal and child health channels, that it now is higher than HIV. The HIV is planing off but um, a, a really remarkable um, shift that has happened. Now, unpacking this and understanding what the policy implications are when is really what we're here to try and talk to. And Ariel, could you lead us off with some thoughts about what does this all mean? <coughs> well, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, thanks to CSAS for bringing us together on an important topic, and it's really a great, great report. Thanks, uh, uh, Chris, for your leadership all along, the intellectual leadership you were saying I'm just a puppet of the guys who do the work, but actually they've been doing the work that you designed uh, over several years and put together very carefully so that we can all 
really fantastic tool also that you have now, as, as you have shown here. So uh, thank you and congratulations. It's particularly good to see that you have been able to not only develop a system to get the data to all of those channels and complexities, but also fully digitalizing the national health account in which you also play an intellectual role and where USAID, the bank, WSHO, now Gates, have been playing an important role. Getting these things right is almost as important as, as the epidemiology or the health systems dimensions. Measurement, of which Chris has made a name in, and uh, is of course paramount, and it has been a signature of the field of global health. Compared to other areas, I think we do particularly well uh, in terms of getting data, and the data is never perfect, but uh, it, we've been able to, to, to get better at it, starting from the uh, a population service, fertility service of the 60s and 70s, and then demographic service and national health accounts, and so many bits of that that uh, give us an advantage in defining problems, solutions, and progress, as we have seen here. Uh, I think that uh, I was particularly interested in your last bit on, on the distribution of uh, assistance given uh, burden of disease, which are two pieces you understand very, very well. Uh, I, I was stricken, I was asking, uh, why is there so much MCH, DAH in Argentina? So we, we, we put nothing there, but it's like the one thing that crosses all your, your lines in your system. Uh, a, there are many challenges, issues technically, which you mind, issues of inflation, issues of sometimes we contribute in, for example, in Western Africa more to regional mechanisms, in part because some small countries may not have a full office uh, and so on. And also, as you exclude humanitarian efforts that sometimes also include health, nonetheless, some of the countries in conflict or, or failed states where we do more health through humanitarian means than through the ones that you cover, it may give you, and uh, maybe there's a, a way for, in the future, account for some, some, some of that. Uh, a, and I see Wade uh, Warren, my deputy who oversees, every year we are trying to always align uh, our investments indeed with the greatest burden of disease and go to this exercise regularly. So again, this is very, very useful. But back to the piece, uh, your methods uh, that uh, Steve has made. I think this is indeed fantastic numbers for, for global health, despite uh, uh, the recent recession uh, in, around the world. No cliffs, as Chris noted. Uh, a, and I think that uh, a, some people will claim that during eras of austerity, investing in people, investing in systems is even more important than, than when you are thriving. And so we really appreciate the fact that the US government in, uh, with strong bipartisan support has continued, continued to support our work in, uh, in global health, particularly both for the Global Fund for HTV Malaria, which we have really revamped our investments through the Global Fund, as well as in the area of material shell health where uh, the overall global community and USAID and the president has really stepped up the plate in terms of making it a priority. And if you add malaria, which has also grown uh, very much in this area, to the MCH pool, because malaria is mostly about saving young children's lives. So I think we are in good shape for that, for that new area of, of importance. Uh, and on the whole, I think the optimistic picture that you, you convey here in terms of these numbers is also uh, a, a, a marker of our times. We are in a great time for global health. Uh, both in terms of the resources that we continue to, to get there. All of you working, of course, in this area, the results. We have been, I mean, 10 years ago, we could not have imagined neither these resources nor uh, the results. Uh, we were just, everything was blurred by AIDS, uh, and things have come a long, long way. And that has invited us all to imagine even bolder possibilities, like an ace regeneration or any preventable child maternal death which, uh, as the Lancet Commission report in December, invites the possibility of a grand convergence in life expectancy between rich and poor nations. I grew up in Mexico, where life expectancy in 1950 was 44, and the US was already 20, 20 years higher, 20 years higher. And the US has grown another 15 years of life expectancy in this half a century. So it's almost a 35 years gap in life expectancy from one corner to the other of this period between Mexico and the United States. If you erase AIDS from the world, life expectancy will probably increase by two or three years. So 35 years, 
Well, Mexico has gone to that grand convergence and is now only two or three years behind the United States. So certainly these bold possibilities are already taking place. We don't need to imagine them. They are taking place and of course, we have a lot of work to do still in areas where this is not the case. Uh, an, an important thing in terms of the policy, Steve, is that as we are succeeding in Latin America and parts of Asia and Europe, uh, even if our budgets may seem to be flat, we are actually bringing down resources from the missions we are winding down, which have been like 25 missions around the world, and actually increasing the resources, even during the last five years, in countries, priority countries for our, our agendas in Africa and South Asia. So uh, even during this time, our missions are enjoying uh, an increase in the resources for the countries where the need is uh, greatest. Uh, uh, but also, I'm very happy that the report has a chapter, if you get to read through it, uh, on uh, governments, local governments investing in their own health. And part of the narrative uh, in this period uh, at USAID is that of an economic transition of health, where uh, success in economic development, also unprecedented in our history, is leading to growth in uh, health expenditures locally. And the report captures that, that very well and is very good in the concept of crowding back in. In some areas, we crowded out governments, maybe in some of the darker countries of uh, investments uh, versus government or, DA or burden of disease, we crowded out some of the local investments and we are now seeing some crowding back in by local governments, which is essential for country ownership, for successful stewardship and for long-term sustainability. But something that we also know from many other analyses is that as countries do move from low to middle income, a DAH withdraws or gets diluted. And that's natural, is to be expected. And we should also expect the governments to fill the vacuum left by DAH. And that does not seem to happen when countries move from low to middle income countries. And you see a filling in with out of pocket expenditure. Later on, as countries move to the upper middle income status, the public financing for health begins to increase again. But we have this ditch, which is predictable in the financing, which is dysfunctional in the financing of health in countries. So as we are succeeding with development, as we are succeeding with countries being able to have more local resources, making sure that the public financing and the organization of those resources away from the out of pocket dysfunctional and inefficient and regressive ways of financing. And that requires a different mindset than the disease by disease focus that we often take in this area. So there's been a great conversation now taking place globally on mobilizing domestic resources uh, for health. And I think that that's gonna gain more and more momentum as we discuss with many of our partners. Uh, a, even the way in which some of our partners intermediaries work in this new financing landscape means new sources of financing will become available uh, to them as your business models evolve. And this will be particularly important as many countries in the developing world are increasingly uh, having bold uh, uh, goals of moving towards universal health coverage and that can only happen with increased mobilization of domestic resources. This economic transition of health is also important uh, uh, because some of, the, of those countries like BRICS are still not spending enough in, in development assistance compared to uh, the proportion of the economy in the world they already represent. And so they are now beginning to move. We certainly want to nudge more of that in the future. It's an, a new, fresh opportunity here. Uh, but also, uh, because of this growth, it means that most of the poor patients that were in low-income countries are now finding themselves in middle-income countries. So, local resources in those middle-income countries become more important to still achieve the goals that we all have for, for global health. But it is the case that in many poor countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, eh, even in the next 10 to 20 years, those economies may not be able to afford the basic package of health services. And even in Africa, where maybe 20 countries in this decade are reaching middle-income status, that means the other half will not, and will not even into next decade. And that means in those places, uh, it will remain a challenge. So the need for us to continue to invest in global health, particularly in those countries, remains very strong. And, uh, but also the need to make sure that since many of them will not have enough to buy the basic services, that the health systems are there to, be, to provide maximum efficiency in the delivery of resources they do have, uh, even if they're insufficient on the one hand. 
And second, that we all continue to invest in innovation to make sure that those packages are cheaper uh, and simpler to implement in the future. Otherwise, it will not be an easy task for many of the poorest countries uh, in Africa. So we do see optimism because even in Africa, excluding Sub-Saharan Africa, growth has been like 6% a year, the fastest growing region in the world. So there are many possibilities here for a future that will be different than where we were 10 years ago. So I remain very optimistic, Steve, about the overall enterprise of global health and about the support that the USG will continue to have for global health. Thank you. Chris, would you like to offer any thoughts what Ariel said? I mean, <clears throat> no, I think I largely agree with what Ariel said. I think, you know, we've had, uh, just back on the first comments about what's in the envelope, what do we describe as development assistance for health? We've had a lot of uh, debates over the years about do you or do you not count humanitarian assistance? And I think the, the, the point that there's sometimes uh, development assistance for health that goes through those vehicles is a, is a good one. It's sometimes hard for us to sort of be able to disentangle what's mm -hmm. just straight you know, crisis intervention versus actually about uh, health. Uh, I, I also think that there's a theme about Central Africa and West Africa that will remain with us for a while. Because when we look at outcomes, that's where the biggest uh, laggards are in any vision of radical progress in the future, which is if you take current time trends and say, who's the most at risk of still having high child mortality mm -hmm. or high maternal mortality? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really Central Africa and West Africa and a few other fragile states. And so I think there is a message here about money and a vision about grand convergence, for example, that that might need a strategic rethink about how much the world spends in these very poor places that have not been uh, receiving as much as others. Chris, the, I was trying to enumerate what the most powerful impressions were from your analysis, and I just wanted to quickly just summarize those and ask your thoughts and Ariel's. Um, one thing that jumps out is that in a period of austerity, summits and replenishment processes really matter even more than they did before. I mean, when you look at the surge on maternal and child health, the London summit, you look at the Abu Dhabi gathering on vaccines, you look at the global fund replenishment, we're now in the midst of the early stage up to Gavi Lats. These become very important tools in sustaining this, this, this growth. And, and second is you make the point that U.S. leadership remains very essential in partnership with others. That $11 billion number that's put out there is a powerful number as a portion of $31 billion total. You also make the case that it's very concentrated, increasingly concentrated on Africa. And the other big powerful, another big powerful impression is that the NCDs remain the big exception. They had a summit. It didn't work. They had um, WHO aspired to do more, then it faded. Bloomberg took on the tobacco agenda, then began to scale back. It's not grabbed, and in, and in a way, the gap between what happens in that sphere and other spheres by your sort of between the lines in your analysis, that gap seems to be growing. Which gets me to the last point, which is the, your point about trying to look at dollars against dallies and bur the burden of disease is that there is some, some uh, ser serious misalignment that may look at uh, may look irrational in a way, but but requires some political consideration. NCDs, the fact that the lower and middle income countries have such an ever greater share of the poor and those with the burdens of disease, but don't remain the major clients for our programs. The systems work, which remains a paltry investment, along with the NCDs. And as you point out, areas like West Africa, Central Africa, which are screaming out for more attention, but which are, which are not given the same level of prioritization as, the, as you point out, the sort of PEPFAR corridor. Can you just talk a bit about, OK, when you look at that picture, it's a mixed set of impressions. Um, what do you make of that in terms of the message that you, you would want your audience to take away on policy? I mean, how does that add up to a so what question? OK, you painted this picture. Now what are we supposed to do? I think when you paint a picture, part of what we're trying to do is uh, 
to reflect back the totality of where people know well bits of that picture, but yeah. sometimes they miss the total picture. And I think there's a value in, in, in a lot of what we try to do of just saying, uh, this is what the evidence says about money, about disease burden, and you know, it's for sometimes it's for people to sort of say, well, that's different than what I thought. And so often you have that reaction that when you paint the total picture, it's it's not what in in a particular area people had as the base for their dialogue. And so I think there's a value in that. Um, stepping back. Uh, if you look at the where development assistance of health goes, uh, or any development assistance, there's lots of factors that go into that. There's geopolitical right. factors. There's you know prioritization for the poorest. Uh, there is areas where you think you can make the most difference. Um, you know, I, I always resist a little bit the temptation that people have to say, uh, take you know the dollars per dally for HIV, for TB, for malaria, for MNCH, and for NCDs, and say they should be equal. Of course, they shouldn't be equal mm -hmm. because uh, we can be more effective at some of those programs. They're harder to fund nationally. Uh, and uh, success breeds success. You know, we should, we've got to remember that the success of a a ART rollout and PMTCT has been a part of the fuel for the whole global right. health expansion. Right. So that's sort of why I think you have to think of all those other factors when you look at those. But it's also useful to put up the empirical fact that uh, there's a lot of growing NCD burden in low and, and lower middle income countries. And their governments in those countries are yet to fund action in a way that seems commensurate with the problems that are emerging. Mm -hmm. Is that going to change? Well, it doesn't look like it currently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that gets back to how hard it is to convince the public and uh, broader groups that uh, special attention from the North is required to deal with those right. issues in the South. Right. Are you any thoughts? Well, yes, on the NCD on, on the NCDIs, we have been having a lot of discussions, as you can imagine. We all see the data, and uh, we all agree that this is an issue that we claim or should have more attention and support. And USAID has a lighthouse strategy making sure that our measurements, for example, in DHSs will have a model for NCDI so that we can at least begin to support the, the description of the problem and, and so on. Uh, has always been an important part of our strategy. We do a lot of things, including some immunization programs that also uh, tackle NCDs, cancers, and so on. And our health system's work is systemic. And so uh, we believe that some of those investments will help countries deal with the patients will come with all sorts of things to the door. I, I do think that uh, given that we had a summit, uh, as you pointed out, and that I'm, I'm impressed how far, because of the data, the leadership has come in making that agenda visible. And at the same time, it's paradoxical in the calculus of the policy of budget, Steve, that the, the, the economic freeze that we had a few years ago in a way, I thought actually it was an opportunity for some rethinking, and it did. It has triggered some rethinking in our agendas, in how we work, how the Global Fund works. So it has been healthy in that sense, to get it right. Some form here, tighten it up. Uh, a, on the other hand, such environment makes it hard for a new agenda to break through with a large significant programming mm -hmm. without taking away from the other things that we still are halfway. So that's made it a challenge uh, policy-wise. And I, I, will, I will think that countries themselves will probably invest more in proportion uh, in, in the NCDs, if we measure that, than, than the DAH in, in that balance. Uh, and that until the economies improve in the donors' countries, uh, we may not have the opportunity for mm -hmm. a big, big program. I, I also think that you're right about health systems being buried in the pile of, of graphs here, but it's actually been growing in the last five years, and uh, it's grown fast. Uh, just like the NCDs have grown fast, but for a small, from a small base. Uh, and we have systems investment. I have to add, now that I understand a bit how money flows through our system, at least a lot of investment has been made that is accounted under PEFAR, for example, on health system strengthening from the first five years of a vertical delivery emergency to the second five years where PEFAR built a lot of efforts with governments in local capacity uh, in many of the countries we were. So there's a lot of that health systems that may be harder to disentangle 
uh, in the way we currently report uh, that may give us a bit more optimistic sense of where we're going. Thank you. I'm gonna, I wanna ask one question around the optimism uh, and then I'd like to turn to our audience for some comments and questions. My question around the optimism is throughout the document, you, you, you lead the reader to believe that we're on, a, we're on a very promising trajectory, that the bank, that global fund's gonna rebound and continue to rebound, that the fundamentals that you've identified which are driving this resilience will stay in place. Um, just to be, play the devil's advocate here, um, sequestration is not over. We still have a, 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 a major looming problem that's going to put continued pressure on the US. The global fund, when it was able to, when it had its replenishment in December, the 12 billion that it, that it achieved was significant and promising, but it was really the sort of minimum necessary to preserve credibility, and it was far less than what people had hoped for. And the, 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 the problems that other donors are having in coming forward is now constraining the U.S. ability to bring forward the full amount, right? And Gavi, you know, as you point out, Gavi benefited from, at the summit, a major infusion coming from the Islamic Development Bank. That may be a one-off sort of thing, it may not be, but I, when you look at these and unpack them, you could make the case that there's still a lot of good reason to be quite cautious about the fragility of all of this. And so I wanted to throw this back and ask you, you know, is the optimism that's so fundamental to this, is it a little mis overstated, do you think? Uh, so if you go back to the financial crisis, uh, you know, what happened in 2008? Well, you know, people who hadn't looked at uh, previous crises said, oh, you know, we're going to fall off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the IMF correctly pointed out that the peak fiscal impact of a crisis is, you know, four to five years later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they confidently, and I, I, one, of our, um, one of our advisory groups was somebody from the IMF, and they said, you know, you know wait and see. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you had these two different stories. You had the global health people in panic saying, you know, the funding will, will dry up. And I think in, when we saw a peak in a sort of small downturn, you know, I think people thought that that was the, uh, the early signs. But if the IMF's right, 2013 should have been the year the, of the worst right. effects of the financial crisis, given past uh, history. And so in my mind, the fact that we, we through you know, complex mechanisms, shift to multilateral uh, funding, uh, and the role of, of the UK, uh, the fact that we didn't see that downturn, I think is a good sign. I mean, are, is it, can the world shift away from development assistance in general, from development assistance for health? Surely. So I think it's a constant uh, issue, and one shouldn't take it for granted. What's happened in AusAid, you know, is a is a cautionary tale um, that you know you can pretty abruptly see major changes right. in funding. So, right. yeah. well, thanks. It is a very fair point, uh, both in the U.S. and in the rest of the global donors landscape, uh, with the global fund, which has turned around. I mean, there was almost a coincidence of where things were with the fund and this management and the possibilities. There's been a turnaround, no doubt, and, and yet, and yet, the fully matching of the two-to-one match expected by the U.S. Congress uh, is still something we need to work at. It's not, it's not a given. And so we need to work and make sure others also come through the Global Fund uh, in this area. And on the U.S. side, here, on the hill itself, is still not there. I mean, we, it's still mm -hmm. a dance, as you said. We still have to make the case. We have to... I mean, the Congress has been, given the circumstances, quite generous. And uh, the president has, to be, has been trying to be careful, of course, mm -hmm. because of the, the whole situation is not totally, we're not out of the woods yet. And so I think that, uh, and that's a case in point with 2014 budgets, where the Congress actually gave us more than we asked. And, uh, and in, in a way, our 2015 was based on the 2013, and so it's, it's an interesting dance for us to try to be uh, sensible given the situation, and, and yet at the same time the results, the case that's been made 
continues to engage the Congress, I certainly hope we'll do the same in 2015. Thank you. I'd like to invite some comments and questions from the audience. Uh, why don't we st we'll start over here. We're going to bundle things together. We start down front, Carl and Deborah, and, uh, and then we'll come back here. Uh, please identify yourself and, uh, and your organization, and please be brief. Yes. Thanks, Steve. Um, Carl Hoffman, President of Population Services International, PSI. Been a rich conversation already. Thanks very much. I don't think there's any organization that's been more influenced by the work of IHME and um, Chris than my own, because uh, we absolutely use DALIs, as I think many of you know, to, to uh, track our progress and to, they are our retained earnings in a sense. Uh, we are trying to optimize and maximize DALIs. It's a, it's a line that runs through a conversation every day at PSI. So we thank you for that. The, the companion piece, I think, that you alluded to at the start of the conversation, the global burden of disease data, um, is also you know, profoundly important, I think, to this conversation. And I think the mismatch between resources, which I agree are robust and about which we should be optimistic and happy, the mismatch between the resource picture and the burden of disease picture is still significant and growing. And I guess I would build on, on uh, Steve's comment, really, to say, typically, I tend to be a glass half full sort of guy, but um, this optimistic resource picture is in a way a little bit fragile. I think both Ariel and I, I think we're probably at the breakfast around the global fund replenishment that took place up on the hill. And there was, a, there was a parade of members of Congress who came up to speak at the lectern about how proud they were to have been associated with the fight against HIV. One after the other, in the, back in the 1990s, talking about great <coughs> moments of leadership around HIV from the 1990s. Well, that's been great to mobilize the US political commitment to development assistance for health, but it's still sort of doesn't respond to that burden of disease, that much more complex burden of disease picture. And I think that's a real challenge for us all to do the educating necessary to shift the resource flows more toward what we know is killing and sickening people. I guess a comment and Thank you. about your reactions. Hi, I'm Deb Derrick. I'm president of Friends of the Global Fight, so I work on global fund issues. Um, and my question is, in looking at the charts that you put together, Chris, and the allocations given to various diseases, there was an increasing proportion given to unallocatable section or other. So I'm curious to know what, and it was a substantial growth over time, so I'm curious to know what's that comprised of. It was up to about 18%. There was a hand up in the middle here. Hi, I'm Nena. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown Law. Uh, my question was uh, regarding your opinion on the participation of uh, funds like the Global Health Investment Fund, which essentially functions much like a private equity fund, wherein it gets uh, private contributors and goes ahead and makes sustainable investments into greenfield projects, uh, possibly to finance uh, uh, medical trials, development of drugs, uh, global health infrastructure, et cetera. What role do you think going forward uh, structures like those can play in uh, financing global health? Could you just hand that over here, please? And we'll come back. We'll make that our first round. We'll move over this part of the, uh, of the room momentarily. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Joanne. I'm the president of the Center for Global Health and Diplomacy. My question was to Chris, uh, following up on Deb's question of uh, resources you cannot track. We have private sector donors that are donating now over half a million dollars. And it's not recorded, and it's very much under the books. I mean, how do you track some of that? It's you know, affecting the Global Fund. The Global Fund received, I think, $2 million over the past year from Middle East private donors. So I think that's a big sort of variable that needs to be tracked at some point. Thanks. OK. Chris, you want to? So I hope the IRS was listening to that. Uh, but uh, let me take the last one first, uh, joking aside. 
Uh, we, we do capture a lot of private contribution. I think uh, Steve alluded to the fact that NGOs are able to raise, in addition to government money, substantial uh, resources from private donors. And so as long as they're in 990 tax returns, we'll find them. Uh, and so, you know, it's more about the universe of the entities that we include. So there's probably some academic centers or policy centers that may not be on the, the list that we are trying to track. And each year we try to, you know, incorporate. So this year, for example, we were able to capture some of the international-based NGOs, whereas in the past we trust track U.S. NGOs. So we're getting better at that. But where we can, we get from the tax returns because, uh, you know, people do have to report their taxes. Uh, now, and, you know, anything that's going through a, a channel like the Global Fund, we're picking up. And, and, and that's going into uh, those, the, the source and, and the uh, channel numbers. I do think there are these other groups out there that we can increasingly improve and, and add as we go forward. On the unallocable, the dollar amounts are going up, but the percentage is actually going down. So we're actually pretty pleased with the fact that over time, data is getting better. We're, we're getting better reports from some donors that in historically didn't give you much detail. Uh, and so I think transparency and accountability is improving, and our capacity to shrink the percent unallocable is going down. We'd love it to be zero, but uh, it sort of reflects the state of data. I mean, there's some groups that are super transparent about how they spend their funds, you know, DFID, online database for all their projects, and then there are other donors that it's, it's really quite difficult. Uh, so I think it's also a bit of a demand from users in the community that, that seems to be pushing in the right direction, that that percentage is, is moving down. Uh, to the, to the uh, question about alignment between burden and, and uh, DALIs, you know, I think it's a really interesting one. The, the thing to me that, that's the, probably the, the most, uh, or could be one of the more important uh, turning points is what happens post-2015. Like, where is the role for health in the post-2015 agenda? And is the post-2015 uh, goal for health, if there is one, we all hope, uh, is it framed in a way that simultaneously has a broad view, uh, but also is you know, aspirational and motivational so that people are excited about it? And I think there's, there's real tension there, because if you want it to be reduce the burden or you know, prevent death and disability, uh, yes, that's the right thing to do, but uh, it's hard to get hearts and minds that way and, and, and continue resources flowing. So I think how the world navigates that really key moment, uh, I think will have a big influence on the trajectory for, for, for funding. Did you have anything to say on the private equity Oh, question? yeah. I mean, we've actually been trying to talk to various groups about the whole general movement about social investment funds. Um, and, you know, there's a number of active groups. Uh, interesting, uh, you know, some of the bigger banks have got some interesting advisory work on that. So we're starting to try to, to uh, get our hands around the whole area around social investment funds. So not much to say yet, but something that we're, we're, it's on our radar. Are you on start? Yes, on the, on the distribution resources per Dallas. I think that, uh, as I said, we, we are very mindful of that and, and looking at, at it. And I, I do take the point on Central and Western Africa where we've been discussing a lot again and, and how we progressively shift resources there. Technically, it's important to know that Again, some of them may be the poorest or frail states, there's the humanitarian issue. We have sometimes regional approaches to the budgeting and it's hard to, maybe it's in the unallocated part that actually goes to those countries predominantly and we could check on that. Uh, likewise, uh, in some other countries, it is a dance between the ODA and the local expenditure, so the total expenditure may not necessarily be suffering because ODA is there, so maybe there's a healthy engagement of domestic resources where you would suggest that maybe we are under-investing. So th these are all those issues. And, and then in, in, there's the regional politics. And it's less so about geopolitical alignment of budgets. It's really more about champions. There's the people who work in, in Latin America and the Hill, and they want to make sure that we, they're not looking at Dallas. They, they simply are saying, we still have people dying here. We have ill people here. We, I mean, they, they see their problems. And so they're not looking at Dallas, they're not looking about geopolitical rationale. They're simply saying, don't, don't take all the money away from Latin America. Don't take all the, way, the money away from Central Europe. 
And, uh, and then, of course, when sparks happen, as we have seen recently, then people say, well, there's also that rationale that perhaps is indeed a healthy thing. So uh, the DALIs will never be perfectly aligned, even if they were perfectly technically measured. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we should continue to do more. I think that Western Cent uh, and Central Africa is an area where we, we can do more if we're not doing it through the regional mechanism. And on global investment funds and private sector, I think the private sector will be more and more important. And uh, some of those resources may be harder to account because many multinationals may be providing now investment, direct investments. They provide services that may or may not be captured, may not be accounted clearly as DAH. Uh, and yet these are uh, predominance of the resources will be flowing in that way. We, we don't have enough of a handle on uh, direct investment in health. Uh, a, and it's an area that probably will grow in the future. It's not been traditionally big, but it's important. And when we look at pharmaceuticals, the area that perhaps is the most familiar with in this, in this sense, we look at the markets growing in Africa where today maybe all of the DAH on commodities, pharmaceutical commodities may be it would be good to measure it, but I think we have assessed to be four or five billion dollars, and yet the market there might be closer to 20 billion already and likely to double by 2030. So the private resources and shaping those markets that will seek efficiencies, but mm -hmm. we can help shape them for equity, for quality, building institutional capacities, regional platforms. So it offers a new sort of opportunities for uh, our DAH, because it will be required to shape those markets, but with greater leverage, and I think market shaping is emerging as a great opportunity for our work. Thank you. There was a very flattering piece in the New York Times today about AID and Ron Shaw um, uh, around these changes that are underway. Yes, market shaping is great. Credit uh, uh, guarantees is working to leverage a lot of resources so that it, it brings, it smooths the planning and, and it, prevents uh, stock outs and so on, or you may decrease the price of many commodities in implantable contraceptives, or in, in the case of the New York Times piece today, how GE can contribute with some uh, credit guarantees and equipment for the Nelson Mandela Hospital in South Africa, for example. Let's take another round here. Um, the, behind the woman in the green, green jacket there, please, and then there's two other gentlemen right front. Yes, please. We'll do another round and then come back. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, my name is Moga Kamaliani. I work for Oxfam, and I just want to thank you because it's a, a series now, and we wait for your report every year. Um, so basically, we're, we're chasing here, or we're tracing rather the quant. Sorry, I've got hearing aid, and it's, it's just a, sorry. So we're, we're tracing the quantity of aid. What we also worry about is the quality of aid. Still, quite a lot of aid is short term. Um, so therefore, as I, I'm looking from the other side, you know, not the donors, the recipients, being one of, uh, a citizen of one of those countries. Um, so basically, it's short term, so that our government cannot invest in long term solutions, like, you know, strengthening health system, which we all talk about. This is not like saying we vaccinated five children, which can hit the media and be, not to say that vaccination is not, is not important, of course it is. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, it's still tied aid. It's not perhaps tied in the sense that American money buys American cars or UK money buys UK whatever. It's not in terms of that, but more dangerous, I would say, it's tied aid in terms of the ideas of how you're going to spend this money. We released a report yesterday on how the World Bank advised the government of Lesotho on um, re, um, building a new hospital um, in, the, in a very, I mean, you know Lesotho, very poor country, 80% of the population are rural. They helped them to build this big hospital. The agreement was it's at no extra cost um, to the government, you know, more cost than the old hospital. What happened is this hospital is eating 51% of the national health budget. So, you know, it's just bad advice. And my last point is about accountability. So you want us, our governments, to be accountable to who? Well, to donors, really. But we don't have the donors accountable to us. So, you know, the, the, the IFC of the World Bank is not accountable to the people of Lesotho about the bad advice. And measure on that, take on that, you know, other donors. We need mutual accountability. And we, 
We need to take into account what are the ideas that we have, what are the things that we have in our countries. So a public-private partnership in a hospital is just not working Thank you. in this country. Thank you. There's right here and down in front, right here, and then across the way there. Yes, Thank sir. you for being here and sharing today. Um, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV. And in a sense, following up on this conversation, looking at the other side of this of delivery, what, what is the tracking mechanism to see how that the resources are actually being delivered within country and looking at all levels of government, the local area, the regional governments, and at the national level? So that uh, that builds in transparency and uh, also at the same time allow people that have real needs are actually getting the service that Thank donor you. nations are paying for. Thank you, Thank you very just much for being here. Just across the way there, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Hernan Rosenberg uh, with the Global International uh, Health Advisors and uh, previously with WHO and uh, um, the Global Fund, as a matter of fact. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one is, I think what you're doing is fantastic in terms of uh, flo following financial flows. However, not all resources are financial. So I wonder if you have any guesstimate or idea of what is, you know, like the University of Miami flying surgeons to Haiti to take care of uh, people there. I'm not sure that that shows up in any statistic anywhere. So I wonder about that, that's number one. And the other question that I wanted to formulate is, to what extent the alternative channels becomes complements or supplements? In other words, to what extent you're doing what at the expense of the other? Uh, because this is one effect that we had when, when we started with the, with the Global Fund, is that indeed you increase the amount that came from the Global Fund at the expense of something else because you already had the Global Fund. So I wonder about that, thank you Great. very much. Let's take one other this gentleman right here. Howdy, I'm Thomas Ward. I'm an economist. I was at the World Bank and other places, and I do a lot with PPPs because I look at sustainability. So I'm thinking about the sustainable funds and other places. And year after year, there's also talk about the growth of global population. So the question I have is not only the funds going out, but what's the sustainability and the impact if we are having kids living longer, are we going to create a problem down the road? Okay. Chris? Okay. Uh, that's a, those are some uh, important questions. So on the, the quality of aid, and let me tie that to the last, uh, or one of the, the later questions about uh, crowding out. I mean, more generally, uh, what's the effect of aid? And I think, uh, and is there, you know, is multilateral aid or bilateral aid different? Uh, is disease-specific aid versus system strengthening different? These are a, a series of really important questions for which, you know, we actually have uh, comparatively weak information, uh, which shouldn't be the case, right? These are actually pretty central to what we know. Uh, Joe Dielman, who's sitting in the front here, who's our uh, faculty lead on health financing, has actually been doing some interesting things on trying to see what we know does happen, which is ministries of finance are intelligent, and <laughs> very rational decision makers, and they see big influxes of money coming for a particular topic, they put their resources usually somewhere else. Uh, and that's quantifiable and seems to be generally occurring. Uh, I think the really interesting question is the one that, that Ariel talked about, which is what happens when the aid goes away? Do they put the money back? And they do and they don't. They put it back, but they probably don't put as much back as they took out. And so, you know, I think there's some very complex dynamics. I don't think we really have a great handle on that, but I think it's a really important issue to think about the mid to long term. Uh, and that's sort of you know, back and forth and how ministries of finance play actually turns out to be a very compelling argument that aid flows that bounce around actually make things mm -hmm. worse. And that if they're steady, you actually end up with more counterpart funding or government funding uh, in, in the mid to long term. So there's a, there, I, I wouldn't say we have clear answers. I think the things we know is there's a lot of aid. I think you can make a very strong case that that aid's had impact. Uh, in a bunch of areas, and I think the evidence is accumulating about impact, whether it's maternal or child or, or MDG6. Uh, but I think the behavior of governments and the mid to long term effects on systems are, are pretty poorly understood. So I totally agree we need to understand more about uh, quality and, and behavior. Um, 
I think everybody benefits on transparency, uh, whether it's in country or from donors. Uh, and I think the more that there's general calls from everybody in the community, whether they're uh, in local communities or in the international arena for you know, uh, financial transparency, whether it's government or donors, uh, everybody benefits both just because that's probably good practice and also it allows different <coughs> groups to analyze the information, feed that into a, a more informed, uh, broad public dialogue. And so we're strong advocates for more transparency on the financial side. Well, the last one of flows in kind, no, we don't capture the surgeons from Florida. Uh, we haven't figured out a way, we'd like to in principle, but we haven't figured out a way to capture that. They don't get reported anywhere and it's actually pretty hard. Uh, but we're always open to good ideas on how to try to pick up flows in kind. We get technical flows in kind. So we're capturing the technical assistance from you know, the bank or WHO or others of, of the, their salaries that go into providing technical assistance. So those are captured. Last on population, you know, that's a, a, a the, the population story uh, with many people in the room who, who probably know more about it uh, is, is pretty interesting because if you go out a few years on forecasts, uh, population's a big issue uh, in terms of its you know, increasing demand for services, uh, increasing numbers of people who need care, particularly in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. I think in many other parts of the world, we're at the point where you know, fertility rates are converging pretty dramatically. I mean, Iran's fertility rate is lower than ours, and yet you go back 20 years, they had a TFR of five and a half. So, you know, the fertility transition is, is incredibly fast once it starts, and, and we might, <laughs> as much as we pay attention to accelerating uh, or providing population services in Sub-Saharan Africa or helping that happen, we should also be thinking a little bit out to what are the population consequences of a world where fertility rates are conceivably below replacement in most countries. Mm -hmm. Ariel, are you accountable? Well, I have two, two answers to that question. Uh, and the first, if I can also add to your point about <clears throat> the crowding out part, is not only in terms of who finance, but also what do you finance? And I think the question was raised earlier about building a tertiary care hospital in the capital city and consuming 50% of the budget. That has been in many places. It's not usually the donors. Somehow there are local politics that play out that way. In, uh, and it's not a good thing because it does crowd out other expenditures that will be for more basics. And I think the movement towards universal coverage, the progressive path to universal coverage, always calls to ensure all, all people will get access to the basics. Because by virtue of doing that, there's no money for the tertiary hospital right away. Uh, a, and so commitment to that and then building from there as your economy allows is always, always uh, a wiser thing. We have been moving increasingly uh, all of the, the for, for us, the accountability, of course there is there is the accountability for us to the Congress and that's um, organizational accountability. But we all work in this area because for us in the end is to see the world be a better place and be a healthier place. And when we see that happening in many countries where we are slowly withdrawing, as I said before, because of success, to us, that's the ultimate accountability. When countries themselves, as President Kennedy said 50 years ago, can stand on their own and take care of their own needs of their own people. And I think we are seeing that success around the world in a historically unprecedented way. So for me, that's the most important mm -hmm. accountability. USAID has joined the International Health Partnership to be able to better coordinate with other donors and with the governments. And there's been a greater movement now also coming from PEFAR on increasing sense of country ownership. In USAID, we have built that all along, uh, in part because in MCH, the, an area where we predominate in funding, we account, the USG account for 15 or 20% of the total, whereas in HIVAs, we account for almost 70%, including the, the money goes to the global fund. So we are moving increasingly to that country ownership, working with the governments uh, to find the right, the right way. And on the point of sustainability, I agree with Chris that half the world lives in countries where we are now under replacement. That's incredible. So half the world is actually shrinking. And so just from that pure statistical sense, if I can ask it, you need to save those kids, certainly. But in addition, even in countries where you are worrying that there will be too many of them that will get old and will get chronic diseases, will that be a headache? 
Well, it's being made clear, and I think the, the Lancet Commission also made a clear case, that investing in saving those lives and the value that the life itself and the value that the lives the person generates to the economy is one of the best possible investments there are today anywhere in the public and the private sector or in any sector. Thank you. Let's take another round of comments. There's one back here and over two over here. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very Use much. the microphone, please. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Rick Burzon. I'm with the NIH, and uh, thank you, uh, Chris, for yet another fine report. Um, I have a question for you about the whole area of evaluation. Uh, resources over time are uh, sure to be more limited, if not better targeted, to uh, bring together uh, the relationship between uh, DAH and disability-adjusted life years, which uh, is in itself as an outcome tool. Um, you know, some people use it and some people don't, and, don't, and I think that the, the, uh, that outcome is only as good as the data that goes into it. If we had had the kinds of data that you're presenting, uh, we probably could have been, done a better job in selecting the initial uh, 15 uh, PEPFAR, uh, PEPFAR countries that received funding. Um, and then, over time, those kinds of decisions became increasingly political, uh, if not at the start. So uh, as, as you do your work and as your group moves along, um, I think increasingly many of us in government and outside of government want to do as good a job as we can evaluating the programs uh, to which we put money. I know there's, there's been a, a constant uh, back and forth within PEPFAR, uh, within OGAC, of, of doing this, and there's always uh, differences of opinion and different methods and so forth. Can you uh, suggest, or is this an area that your group is looking into um, in terms of recommending perhaps some of the, the most uh, appropriate and optimal ways of evaluating the programs that are funded by outside sources so that we can all get uh, a bigger and more efficient bang for our buck? Thank you. Uh, uh, one person right here, Bree. Bree, there's a gentleman here. We'll come up to next. Yes, please. And then behind you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tia Emmerling from the European Union delegation. And I have a question on chart uh, 37. Um, <laughs> no, that, that chart shows that after Me the Paris remember. Declaration on aid effectiveness, more and more donors, especially European donors, shift their funds towards health system strengthening. And um, if you look at that chart, so you see it's mostly uh, Europe, but it's also Australia, Canada, it's also the European Commission, Seven. but the major donor on health, which is the US bilateral, it is disappearing. So uh, in fact, it gave none in 2011 for health system strengthening. I would be interested in the reasons for that decrease of the US government on health system strengthening and now a zero, obviously. Thank you. If you could just hand back. Yes, please. Um, my name is Jennifer Leopold. I'm with RTI International. And my question is about the title, actually, of the document. I was looking back at last year's report, and it was entitled The um, End of the, the Golden Age, with a question mark. And then for this one to be the end of the era, uh, or transitioning in the age of austerity, I just I feel some very heavy eye rolling from my colleagues in development that don't work in health. Um, and then to see the continuing increasing in trends um, with funding, um, that I'm just kind of wondering what your thinking was behind the title of this one. Sir. My name is Dr. Latiri. Uh, I am the vice president of GIA, which stands for Global Health International Advisors, a think tank specializing in global health. Uh, with your uh, permission, I would like to uh, give a message to uh, Dr. Murray, just coming from Lebanon. Uh, Dr. Karam Karam, the former Minister of Health, uh, heard that you are coming to Washington. He asked me to say hello and to thank you for your help to his country, Lebanon. Um, Chris and I worked together when he was uh, the ADG in Geneva of the WHO, and I was the WHO representative in Lebanon. We had so many uh, activities, burn of disease, uh, health expenditures. In fact, uh, the government of Lebanon 
uh, said that don't forget them because what you have done is a true investment. Now we go to the question. Uh, we talk about uh, global health today. It's, it's, it's the universal health healthcare coverage. Uh, uh, we think locally and we act globally. My question is why you have selected the West and Central Africa and not much about the other regions, e example, South, South America, the Asia, uh, and other areas. Could you please answer that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take one, uh, one, one other, if there are any other comments or questions. Oh, oh right here, sir. Please be brief. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris, for vision, creativity, and, and usefulness more than anything, and, and Ariel for uh, your leadership. Okay, I have a question. Uh, regarding North Africa and the Middle East, there was a decrease uh, of 20% between 2010 and 2011 in figure seven. Uh, what happened there? What is the impact of the uh, political situation and the war in, in those countries? And uh, that's my, my main question. And then have you thought in the part of an analysis and interpretation to use, for example, neglected diseases as a tracer of economic uh, development, socioeconomic development, and health? Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question around why the US is disappearing in terms of health systems. Why the title? Why West End Central Africa? And then why on the, the last the North Africa? And the, so there's a lot of geographic questions here. And an interesting one around the, the transition title. Would you like to start up? Sure. And let me just make a couple comments on the evaluation question. Uh, you know, evaluation is a really big topic. Uh, there's, I think of it as evaluation capital E, where you uh, really are trying to ask a causal question. You know, what caused change? I mean, if you think about formally, that you, there's a counterfactual and you're comparing reality to some alternative state. That's hard, uh, and people debate and dis, uh, argue about the methods and, you know, do you need randomization, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a, there is something that's incredibly useful in the policy sphere that is well short of capital E evaluation, and that's just credible accounting of change. So you look at, for example, uh, the various replenishment exercises that are, go on, and you know they're always uh, there's a preamble to it which says. Uh, you should replenish X, whether it's IDA or Global Fund or something else, because the money was well spent and has achieved a, a tremendous outcome. And if you actually go through some of those, you know, it's pretty credible, but if you go through some others, there's just a tremendous amount of disconnect between the statement that are made and the reality in certain countries. So you have the paradox that uh, in some case, I won't name names, that uh, you know, there's a claim that this institution has led to a huge increase in X, but the trend in X was down in, in that country. Uh, and I think just we would be so far ahead in, in understanding, not of the causal you know, pr academic sense, but just in a, in a rational accounting of the world as we know it, if we had a sort of more universal approach to saying, here's the money going into various places, uh, from government, from people's out of pocket, from donors, here's the actual real trend. And what's a reasonable way to assign that change to each of those actors? And you can get better at, uh, over that. And I think of that as sort of development accounts. And I think we're, that's where we need to go. And, uh, and I'm a huge fan of you know, the sort of high-end evaluation research. We do some of it ourselves. But I think the value in the policy sphere of just getting the accounting right of where there isn't double counting of, of uh, improvement would be pretty, pretty large. To the title, you know, I am the last person involved in titles, uh, <laughs> to be honest, because I have really bad aesthetic sense, and I also am really bad at naming things. So uh, I really, you know, as long as the title <laughs> seemed reasonable to me, I, I went with it. So uh, I would have to, to, you know, defer to others on the choice of, of title. Uh, the geographic questions, you know, 
despite having a, a great fondness for certain regions of the world uh, where my ancestors are from, uh, I, you, know, you, you can't not look at the data and say that there's something special about the, the huge burden very low rates of progress in Central Africa and West Africa, and that's why I keep thinking back to that. That uh, there's, you know, there's there's poor people who are uh, have bad health all over the world and in, in, in different places, and that's part of the the inequalities agenda, whether it's in China or the U.S. or or in Mexico. Uh, but I think at the macro level, I get drawn to the Central West African case largely because of rates of change that there isn't, a, there's much less progress uh, compared to many other places. And so then if you're thinking ahead and you have aspirational visions from people like Ariel that are, that are being set as the goalposts, then who do we need to help the most uh, to, to get there? And that's where the, the focus on those regions, but not to underplay the needs in, in pretty much every country where there's disadvantaged people. Do you have any comment on the, U, the drop in US support on health systems? Uh, well, I, I'll make a, a, a definitional statement, and then I'm sure Ariel will have a comment, yeah. which is that was health sector support, which is a particular mode of sort of you know mm -hmm. unrestricted funding going for uh, health sector support. So I think there's a distinction there to be made. And the other problem there is teasing out, you know, how much of disease-specific programs are for health system strengthening. And I mm -hmm. think there's a distinction to be made there. Mm -hmm. As we said, health system is actually growing. And uh, in USAID has established an office dedicated to health systems and to try to advance more explicitly the work that is being done across many of the disease-based programs that nonetheless also support health systems. But your question is uh, sector uh, support. They are specified support to the sector through the Ministries of Finance uh, in, or Health. And I think there are many, many points as to why we don't do a lot of that traditionally or recently. Uh, first, unlike some other donors who may not have missions on the ground, where when you have that, you have an opportunity to really invest in specific areas more so than if you are not present in the country where it's easier then to just support the sector as a whole. It's just a fact. Second, I think PEFAR was something new. PEFAR is big. It's almost two-thirds of what we do. And it was new. There was no, the, the sector did not have that infrastructure a decade ago. So PEFAR came in big time, not through a system that existed to be, to be just invested upon, but needed to build first a parallel system, but more recently increasingly working with the systems. Third, part of the, one of the approaches was the sector-wide approaches that were uh, popularized five years ago, 10 years ago. I think there have been many lessons as to the virtues of, of those approaches. And even the UK, a big champion, has now trimmed back some of the approach. Uh, going forward, as I said before, we have joined the IHP Plus, which allow us to be really around the table with the government and with the other donors in at least jointly deciding how we go. And although, uh, and we have actually many examples of pool financing, which is not quite swap, but we do have many examples of that. And increasingly, one of the directions we have in our programs is G2G. I mean, USAID, one of the big moves is trying to get more local solutions, more local investments, including with the local government, direct to government investments. And we are in a process of doing that. There's a lot of preparation uh, that goes to, to make sure that it will be done right. Uh, but philosophically, we actually at USAID very much agree to do a bit more G2G. The administrator believes we need to do more G2G. And we are trying to learn how to do this right. For PEFAR, it's even more, more new. But with the now country health partnerships approach, there's increasingly openness to do more G2G. We're getting towards the end of the hour here. I'd like to ask Chris to close with just a few thoughts about what is the message or the one or two top line messages in your mind that should be carried from this report to policymakers in the executive and Congress? I think that the, uh, you know, obviously the, the sort of high level story there is that the world has been resilient in terms of funding global health. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to believe that's be linked in some ways to the successes that have occurred. And we, mm -hmm. you know, the evidence is, there's always a lag in evidence. And so the evidence I think starts to accumulate more and more about accelerations mm -hmm. uh, since the big scale up of, of funding. That's not in this report, I think it's coming. 
but I think uh, you know the the more we can link uh, where this huge in, injection of funds has gone, and then trace that to what impact it's had, uh, the better it is for both you know accountability and learning of what works, but also for sustaining that sort of growth through future times. Great. Um, please join me in thanking both Chris and Ariel. Congratulations on a really high quality report. And we look forward to the next, the next round in May. So we're adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Thank you.